Good morning, Redeemer. Good morning. How's everybody doing? You hanging in there? One week left of January. It's moving. So hang with it. You're going to get through it. I know there's a lot of illness out there of a lot of different kinds, but uh, it will pass. If you are a guest, a special welcome today. I'm not sure if I've seen any or not today, but if you are here, we would, we're glad you're here and you're welcome anytime. I would like to uh, just begin with a couple of quick announcements. One is that uh, there is no choir this week. Just a reminder to choir members, vocal choir, there is bell choir at 6 o'clock on Wednesday. So mark that uh, and any other announcements that might pertain to you, just check that out. In the 10th chapter of John's Gospel, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, I know my own. And then he said something else really important. And he said, and my own know me. That's your question today before you. Do you know God? Let's open in prayer. Father, thank you for this new day and this new week. And thank you, God, for this new year and the opportunities that await us. And Lord, even though it comes with or at us with challenges, we know that you are in control and we know you. And Lord, if there would be any who don't know you here today, I pray that you would reveal yourself by your word, by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to begin with a couple of songs. The first is a reminder that he does know us. He knows your name. The Bible says he knew you before he created the world. He knew all about you. That's a pretty amazing thought. The second song is one that's a little more contemporary, recent. If you listen to Christian radio, you will know it. Uh, the God of Angel Armies by Chris Tomlin. And thank you, Sandy and Angie, for leading us in that. our battles for us if we just trust and believe in him.
to your bulletin, please, to our confession of sin. I would invite you to join together as a congregation. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we confess that we are often see difficult circumstances and discouragement as barriers to doing the work you've called us to do. Rather than rejoicing in what you have provided, we lament that we do not have more. Help us to see the gifts that you give and the life that is possible in them. Make your Holy Spirit's work clear so that we can follow and glorify you, finding energy and encouragement on the way. We pray these things in Jesus' name. From 1 John 4, love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. Now, this isn't in your bulletin, but I was supposed to do this back in December, and it got away from me, so I apologize. But we have a new council that was elected by the congregation uh, back in November, and those council members have not yet been installed. They've been doing their job, they just haven't been installed. So what, I'm gonna, what I'd like to do is anybody who is on the council, if you would come forward at this time, whether you've been on the council for a few years or just newly on the council, if you'd all come forward and just come before me over here. And I think it's good for the congregation to be able to see who your, your elected leaders are and remember, uh, because sometimes you have comments or questions and these guys and gals are the ones that you might want to talk to. And I know this isn't the entire council, but we got a pretty good representation. And for those who are new to the council as of November, Jason is our Jason Vandentop is our new president. If you'd turn around, Jason. And Trevor Lease is a new trustee. Marsha Eliason is our new secretary, and Carol Regeer is a new deacon, deaconess, and Greg Ulrichson, a new trustee. Uh, and the others, let's see who's not, uh, I'd rather say who's here than who isn't here, but, but Al Heiser is a deacon, and Marsh, Marshall Nygaard is a deacon, and Gary Schultz is a trustee, and I guess uh, that is who is here today. So, if you'd turn back this, to this direction, please. To those who are new on the council, Jason, Carol, Marsha, Trevor, and Greg, you've been elected by this congreg congregation to serve as officers in accordance with the constitution of our church. Hear the word of God concerning the office to which you've been called. In Acts 6, it says, So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said it's not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. We'll devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So way back even in the first century church when it had just started, there were appointed people to do the different tasks and, and purposes for which uh, council members are elected and called. And we have a little bit different form, perhaps, and each congregation might have a little bit different format, so this is ours. So as deacons, uh, and we're talking here now to Carol primarily, it would be your duty to assist the pastor and council in the work of building up the congregation to help in ministering to the sick or the poor, the distressed, and to help in cultivation of peace, goodwill, and love among the members. In the absence of the pastor, or if the congregation should be without a pastor, you would be involved in helping to make sure the worship services are continuing on their appointed times and are conducted properly and in good order, and that God's word is being preached in faithfulness. As trustees, and that would include this time Trevor and Greg, uh, you are more overlooking and overseeing the property of the congregation and that it's cared for and that its temporal affairs are properly administered. Uh, along with 
Marcia, uh, keeping the records of the church, making sure we're doing what we said we're going to be doing and what you have elected them to do. Uh, all of you working together as one body, and I, I think we've got a great team. I think we've got a great family here to work with. And you know, I'll, I'll just say this in a personal comment. I hear horror stories from pastors about council meetings and congregational meetings. I don't, I've never worried about it and uh, because there's unity and because you understand that calling, I think. And uh, I'm very appreciative of that and I hope the congregation is as well. So I would like to just, uh, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, who has called you into the service of his church, that he would enlighten and strengthen you in your office, and that you may prove to be good and faithful students, stewards to the praise of his holy name. And you are hereby installed uh, as members and as officers of this congregation. In Jesus' name, would you pray and join me in prayer for these new members and our council as a whole. Heavenly Father, thank you for the call that you put on your people. And Lord, every one of us has a calling upon our life. And there are certain times and seasons in life, Lord, when that calling leads us to particular offices and ways of serving your church. And Lord, these new members and these already standing members have committed themselves to that purpose. So we would ask you, Lord, for wisdom, for guidance, for your Holy Spirit to empower them and assist them in their duties. We pray, Lord, that you would give them uh, the leadership qualities that are necessary to lead your church. And we look to you always as our head. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you welcome these new ones and this council? Thank you. And as they're making their way back to their chairs, I would just open up any prayer requests. Uh, the list that I have for our prayer time this morning, we need to continue to pray for Eileen. Is this not? Well, that makes a difference, doesn't it? <laughs> Thank you. The, the prayer list that I have begun in, includes Eileen Huseman. She's, have, she's having a rough time, uh, not feeling well, was taken back up to the hospital later this week. Shirley Peterson, uh, recovering at the home of her daughter, Sandra Lems, received, I think you did if you're on the prayer chain, just recently for Dan Michalowski. The cancer is, has progressed and is causing a lot of fluid buildup, and Dan has said, uh, I'm ready. So he'll be going on. If he, has he started hospice yet, Elaine? Monday. Monday he'll be starting hospice. Uh, Jan, I'm going to save you answering a million questions, the ones you haven't answered already, but Jan had a fall and broke her ankle, and she's here today in a boot. Good to have you here, but we're going to pray for quick healing for her broken ankle. And then, uh, I think this also went out on the prayer chain, the little baby that was born premature, the granddaughter of Tom and Trisha Minsas. I don't know, are you here, Tom and Trish? You're not. They're probably up in the hospital with their granddaughter. Her name is Aurora May, and she's off the ventilator now, so that's good news, and she's, Trish has been sending a lot of pictures and uh, apologizing for bragging about it, but I don't think that's bragging when you're a new grandparent. So I'm going to pray for Aurora May for her to come home soon. And then our, our missionaries continue to pray for the Rons, our mission of the month. I want to open up to other requests. Yeah, I Kathy. I would ask for prayers for my cousin's grandson, Slyton. He's an 11-year-old. You said Triton is how related to you? 
Kathy's cousin's grandson, Triton, 11 years old, in the final stages of cancer. So pray for him, his peace and, and just his witness going through this to his family. I don't know if you could hear that. Triton, she said, knows where he's going and he's not afraid to tell people. So that's, that's God is working in him. So thank you for that. Other requests? Alberta. But Woody's not feeling well anyway, so we'll, we'll pray for Woody. Okay, thank you. Was there another hand over here? Oh, back here. Carla. Yeah, for my sister and her family, she um, lost her son, Jack Carroll, and his associate, Brandon. She had that brain tumor. So, your sister is who? And her son, Chad, passed away, and you said he was a coach at Brandon? Mm -hmm. Okay, any others? Okay, would you join me then? Lord, we just sang a few moments ago that you are always by our side. You command an army of angelic beings who you employ in our assistance and in our warfare. You've given us your Holy Spirit to bring guidance and truth and healing even in our lives. So Lord, we thank you and praise you for your goodness and your grace, your purposes, sometimes that are beyond our understanding, Lord. We pray, Lord, for faith in every circumstance. Lord, we think of this young boy, 11-year-old boy, Triton, and his faith and his readiness to meet you and his uh, upbeat attitude even in the midst of what you say is the last enemy we'll ever face, is death itself. So, Lord, continue to give him words and give his testimony your power and anointing to reach the hearts of his family and, and friends. And Lord, we pray that in whatever time you have given him that would remain on this earth, you would use him as a powerful witness that hearts would be touched and even changed. In Jesus' name. And Father, we pray for Carla's sister uh, who lost a son recently to cancer. And Lord, this is such a, a devastating thing in so many lives. And we understand, Lord, that every person and every family walks that journey in its own way and in different ways and sometimes depending, oftentimes depending on whether or not they know you. And Lord, we don't know these family members, most of us, but you do. So we entrust them into your care and we ask God for understanding and vision and even in the midst of tragedy and loss and grief that you would plant hope and vision and promise of a life that is in Christ and waits every, awaits everyone who looks to you, even through death. So, Lord, bless this family and guide them in the days ahead. Father, we pray for Woody Truman today, not feeling well. And, Lord, there are things in his body that are fighting against him. We know that. We just entrust that into your keeping and ask your grace and your healing power upon him. Thank you for his faith. And Lord, we know he's ready, uh, not that that time is soon, but whenever it would be, but we ask you to carry him through this and bring blessing on his life. In Jesus' name.
Father, we ask for quick healing for Jan DeYoung in this broken ankle, this broken bone. That you would, we thank you for how, where you've brought it to this point, but Lord, we ask that uh, it would heal completely and, and be strong again. Keep her safe and free from any further accidents in the days ahead as she continues to recover. Bless her, Lord, in this time. Lord, we pray for Dan Mikulowski and his family in a lo- what has been a long battle, Lord, and what he now looks upon as nearing the end of this battle. We thank you for faith, and Lord, we pray that you would bolster it in the, this time, in these days, and that his time in hospice, hospice care would be a time not only of physical peace, but a time of spiritual peace, where you speak to him powerfully and you give him the hope and the encouragement that comes with knowing you. So, Lord, we entrust him into your keeping and into your grace. Lord, we pray for Eileen Huseman and for healing in her body. We thank you for last week's report that cancer was not a part of it, but there are broken bones and other issues with which she's struggling and not feeling well at all. So lift her spirits, God, and bring healing to her body. And Lord, we pray for Shirley Peterson in her recovery. Uh, We know she's been battling cancer, and we thank you for the report on that, that it's good, a good report, but her body is reacting to the, the treatment itself, and we pray, Lord, that it would be able to recover And Lord, as as Shirley says, it's so slow, but we pray that it would be steady and continuing to move towards strength and health. So uh, draw near to her, bless her, and uh, pour out your grace upon her. We pray, Lord, for this little girl, Aurora May Minsas, just born on Wednesday morning. We thank you for her life. We thank you for, even though she was brought into this world before it was anticipated that your hand has been upon her, She's brought joy to her family. We pray, Lord, for continued uh, progression in the development of her lungs and her health overall, and that she would continue to be a blessing to her parents, grandparents, and family at large. Father, we want to lift up, as we already prayed for our council, the work of your church right here at Redeemer, right here in this community, that we would be faithful witnesses in a time, Lord, when many don't look in your direction. God, give us the grace, the boldness, the urgency to turn people's heads toward Jesus. Lord, we pray for those who are not near home, our missionaries on foreign fields. We think this month particularly of Brent and Emily Ron and their family in Uganda that you'd continue to be their protection, their encouragement, their life, and that the words you speak, the, the, the duties you perform through them would transform hearts and lead people into a relationship with Christ. Lord, we pray for our nation, our president, our Congress. We pray, Lord, for wisdom, for a unity to be restored. We pray for a vision for our nation that would come from heaven and not from earth. And we pray, Lord, for a humbling just in anyone who might need that to recognize that you are sovereign, that you are Lord, that this world, even though the God of this world, as he's called, is very much at work, but you are sovereign over that and in control of history. And we thank you for that. It gives us hope. It gives us vision. And we praise you that you are God. We pray this in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our responsive reading 
is in your bulletin. I would invite you to turn there at this time. For the sake of Jesus, we suffer the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that we may gain Christ and be found in him. The righteousness from God that depends on faith, that we may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, we may attain to the resurrection from the dead. I ask if our ushers would come forward at this time and receive our tithes and offerings. and I'll call on Scott Montgomery to bring us the readings from God's Word. Good morning. Uh, today's Old Testament reading is from Hosea, chapter 2, verses 16 through 20. It will come about in that day, declares the Lord, that you will call me Isha and no longer call me Bali, for I will renew, remove the names of the Baals from her mouth, so that they will be mentioned by their names no more. In that day I will also make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, the birds of the skies, and the creeping things on the ground, and I will abolish the bow, the sword, and the war from the land, and will make them die or lie down in safety. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in loving kindness and in compassion, and I will betroth you to me in faithfulness. Then you will know the Lord. And our New Testament reading is from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness, through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For those he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Now for this very reason, also applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and your self-control, perseverance, and your perseverance, godliness, and your godliness, brotherly kindness, and your brotherly kindness, love. 
For if these qualities are yours and, and, and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And our gospel today is Luke chapter 12, verses 4 through 7. Please rise if you can. I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear the one who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two cents? Yet not one of them is forgotten before God. Indeed, their very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear. You are more valuable than many sparrows. So ends today's reading. Thank you, Scott. You may be seated. We'll turn to our hymn, I Know Who Holds Tomorrow. You know, as, as amazing as this world is and as wonderful as, as it is, knowing who created it and his ability to create things, I, I, the Bible says the angels watched as God created and they clapped their hands. They must have been just marveling. 
It is an amazing place, but it's also a dangerous place to live. You know that? This is a dangerous place to live right now. For now, we don't have many options, though, do we? So we need to learn how to live lives that are fruitful and lives that are purposeful and rewarding and lives that please God in the midst of a dangerous world. And I say that within the context of this series of spiritual warfare. We live in a dangerous place. And the most dangerous thing about this world isn't injury or illness or things that might lead to our death ultimately. The most dangerous thing about this world, the thing that makes this place a dangerous place to live is the deception that has come over the creation. And I'm talking about the minds and the hearts primarily of the people who live in this world, how deception has crept into that. We talked about that last week. I mean, physical threats are real, and they can take our lives, but that's only physical. You just heard what Scott read. Don't fear those who can kill your body. That's all they can do. Fear the one who determines what happens next. For some reason... It seems really difficult to get people, most people, to view their lives in that perspective because they're so fixated on what they can do and what they can get here and now uh, rather than thinking beyond this life. And that's part of the deception that has come over this whole world, this whole creation. So as people of God, as those who follow Jesus as Lord and Savior, We need to live this life in a way that is based on truth rather than deception, okay? And the only way that can happen, and this gets to our theme for today, the only way you can live your life based on truth is if you're able to recognize truth. There's a lot of deception out there. There's a lot of falsehood. But I'm going to tell you this. You're not going to learn to recognize truth what's deception, what isn't true by focusing on the deception and saying, i got to study that so I can recognize it. Because deception, falsehood, is always changing. It's always evolving. It's switching. It even contradicts itself. The only way you can learn to recognize what isn't true is if you focus on what is true because that never changes. That's the same way they, that experts are able to recognize counterfeit money. They don't study the counterfeits, they study the real thing. And when they see one that isn't the real thing, they say, that's false. That's counterfeit. So once again, I'm asking you, are you reading your Bible? If, if, if our only way of recognizing falsehood is by knowing the truth, it's a really valid question church? Are you reading your Bible? I want to establish the parameters of this spiritual warfare thing in this message today. And the first thing I I want to lay out there is that who you are as a person living in this world is not primarily who you make yourself out to be. Okay? That doesn't determine your identity. Who you are is what really what God makes you. And anything people make of themselves is just illusion. And people are living in illusion, we know that. But when we make something of ourselves, it's illusion. Like Isaiah said in the reading, all, or or like he says in Isaiah 40, it wasn't in our reading, I guess, but he says, all flesh is grass. I mean, it's here in the morning, in the evening it withers, it's gone. All flesh is like that. The last book in the Bible the book of Revelation, the 20th chapter, it it pretty much sets the record straight lest anyone be under the false assumption of his or her greatness in this world. John says, I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books. And by the dead, he means the spiritually dead, those who don't know God. They're judged by what's written in the books, and you know what's in those books? Every deed, every thought, 
every incentive of the heart, it's all written down. That's by, that will be what judges them. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. That's the good news, church. All of our deeds are written down, but if your name is in this other book, the book of life, this gets canceled. If it's not in this book, here's your sentence based on this. So, bottom line, having your name in the Lamb's book of life happens only by knowing God. It can't happen any other way. Every person is either a child of God or a child of this world, which we could say the same thing as being a child of the devil because the, God, the Bible says the devil is the God of this world. So if you're a child of this world, he's your father. Your status, your identity is determined by your relationship with God. And he's given us one way by which we can know him, and that's in the person of Jesus Christ. There's no other way to know him. John writes in 1 John 4, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. Chapter 3 John, of that epistle, he says, you know that he appeared, Jesus, in order to take away sins. A few verses later, it says the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. In other words, it wasn't, he didn't come into this world just to teach us about love. He didn't come just to set an example of how to live. I mean, that's how other religions view Christianity and the whole spectrum of, of faith belief systems. It's just another way of, li of living. He, he did that, but that isn't what destroyed the works of the devil. He had to legally change our status from one of bondage to one of freedom. Because the law of God says that sin kills. The law of God says sin must be accounted for and paid for. God's justice system is very strict. There's no looking the other way with God. Because sin has the power to take away everything that God wants to give. That's why Ecclesiastes 12, 14 says, God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. And, it, and that's not stated just to make sure we get our full punishment, but to make sure there's nothing left that hasn't been accounted for which would incriminate us. Every sin is noted. Every sin was paid at the cross. We need to talk about identity for a minute and authority. A word about our identity first. Did you know that your identity is a legal issue with God? Who you are is a legal... It's part of that justice system I mentioned that he established. And it's Jesus who changes your legal standing because it's he who paid the price of your sin. He's the only one who can change your legal standing with God. When John the Baptist saw him coming... Remember what he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That was under the anointing of the Spirit on John. He prophesied that when he saw him. So when John wrote that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil, he's saying the same thing. Because the, works of, the work of the devil is sin. So when Jesus came to take away the sin of the world, he came to destroy the work of the devil. Does that make sense? So he didn't come just to teach and show us how to live. He came to die on a cross because that was the required payment for your sin. Paul said, for through the law, that's God's justice system, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I've been crucified with Christ. The wages of sin is death. I mean, that's cut and dry. The wages of sin is death. If that, death, if that debt has been paid, your penalty is gone. And the, and the devil's 
power over you, the devil's hold over you, is erased. If your debt is paid, his power over you is gone. You need to know that. So Jesus pays it, or you pay it. That's, that's, the, that's what we're left with. Jesus is going to pay your, your debt to, to God, or you are. I'd rather not pay it myself, just speaking personally here, because it means if that's the case, then heaven is not a part of my future. And besides that, if Jesus pays it, it's already been paid, it's already done. If you're going to pay it, that's in my future. The only reason I can think of that anyone would ever choose that option to pay it themselves is if they didn't understand what they were choosing. I mean, I can't even imagine the, the grief and the regret that will be forever upon those in hell who missed heaven because they didn't accept the payment that was made on their behalf. Something else about having Jesus pay for your sin? When that happens, when your slate is wiped clean, then everything that was taken from you because of sin in your standing with God gets restored. It gets brought back. Your standing with God, your reason for living, and most importantly, your eternal destiny. It's all restored when your slate is wiped clean. Now, I want to talk for a minute about authority. Did you know that every single human being is under authority? I mean, there are a lot of human beings who think they are the authority, but every human being, even those who think they are, are under authority. And e the authority over everybody is either the devil or God. And here's something else we need to know, and this is the amazing thing about knowing God. When you are under God's authority, that authority becomes transferred to you in this life when you become identified with Christ. That authority becomes part of your life. So when a person is set free from the devil's hold over him, over her, the authority in your life transfers from him over you to you over him. That's important to know when we're talking about spiritual warfare, church. Do you believe that you have authority over the kingdom of darkness? If you do, raise your hand. Okay, so, can we do a little self-test on that? So say tomorrow you go up to Sioux Falls, you're in the parking lot at Target, and someone comes up to you who's demonized, demon-possessed, and they start just going after you and, and all kinds of words, and, and you know this manifestation happening right in front of you, against you, and saying everything that, they, that you would never even want to think in your mind is all coming at you, and you don't know what they're doing or what they're capable of. Do you know how you're going to handle that? I mean, if... if I, I think for most of us, just hearing things like that that happen in other people's lives causes the hair on our arms to stand on end, Right? But it does happen, more than you know. And if you think your reaction might be, ooh, I, don't, I would just freak out. I don't know what I'd do. I'd get in my... If that's how you think you would react, I want you to think about the difference between what you're feeling in that moment and what God's Word says to you in that moment. Okay? Because if you're going to live according to how you feel you're going to be manipulated into complete impotency. All the devil would have to do is make you feel weak or ineffective or incompetent or scared, which he's pretty good at doing. I mean, we already talked about how our minds are one of the primary targets in this battle, this spiritual warfare battle, and how vulnerable our minds are to what he wants us to take in if we're not focused on truth. The truth is, when you know God in Christ Jesus, you possess the authority that comes with Jesus' name. If you get encountered by a demon tomorrow, try it, okay? <laughs> okay, 
Because when you know the one who's fighting for you, you bear his name. And that name has all authority. Go back to the, the first chapter of Genesis, the beginning. After God had finished his creation, his final touch being to create mankind in his image, he gave to them, he delegated to them authority. The Bible says, God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, every living thing that moves on the earth. So God put authority over the creation into the hands of humankind and they gave it away. Didn't take them long either. They gave it away. And I can't tell you how important this is in God's justice system to find a way to bring the authority that was given to the devil back into the hands where God put it, humankind. Guess what? God made a way for that to happen. God became a man. Why? To destroy the works of the devil. Remember what Jesus said just as he ascended into heaven just before? He said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Why? Because he had just defeated the power of the devil at the cross. He took back the authority that the first Adam had given away. You know, authority is a highly regarded thing in the spiritual realm. Do you know that? Uh, it's something that, that can't be ignored or disregarded by any spiritual being. So when you bear the name of Jesus by virtue of knowing him personally, your enemy cannot disregard the name you bear or the authority that it carries. You need to know that because he'll try to tell you you're nothing, that it means nothing. Oh, it does, and he knows it. It's all part of a relationship that, we, that, that, that can't be counterfeited like we talked about, it can't in any way be disingenuous. And I know there are a lot of people, I don't know if there are as many as there used to be, who pretend to be Christians. Most people these days would rather not be looked upon as a Christian, it seems. But there are some who pretend to be Christian for whatever benefits they might think it would afford them. And they might even fool some people. But God is never fooled. God is never fooled. And neither are the spirits which are a part of either kingdom, the kingdom of light or the kingdom of darkness. They're not fooled. In Acts 19, Paul was casting uh, an evil spirits out of people in the name of Jesus. Here's what the Bible says. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. And they said, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims and then the evil spirit interrupted him. And he said, Jesus I know. I recognize Paul. Who are you? And they leaped on them and mastered all of them and overpowered them, so they fled out of that house naked and wounded. You know, I don't want any demon, however it would approach me ever in this life or the... I guess it won't be in the next because they'll be taken care of. I don't want any demon saying, who are you to me? I want them to know that when they look at me, Jesus is there. I want them to know that I bear the name of the one they most fear. And even more importantly, when I stand before God someday, I sure don't want to hear him say, I never knew you. I was never in a relationship with you. Because you rejected it. I said this last week. Nobody's going to win this battle on your own. Nobody. Victory comes only when you know God. And the only way we can know him is through Jesus Christ. Jesus says of himself that he is the way, the truth, and the life. He is your steadfastness that in a world that is ever-changing, convulsing with ever-new ideas and ever-new perceptions of reality. 
been reading a book recently on spiritual warfare, and I saw a description of the devil, or I read a description of the devil that I kind of like, because it kind of describes him pretty accurately as we're looking at this objectively. It calls him a real spirit of unreality. A real spirit of unreality. I mean, everything he stands for is deception. Everything he says is deception. Jesus said when he speaks, he speaks out of his own character, for he's a liar and the father of lies. Every promise he makes is false and is made with intent to do you harm. And it's filling, and and the, the dangerous thing is, he brings that message to you, not through most of the time through a demon. Because you'd, you'd, you'd push that away. He brings it to you through somebody you perceive as trustworthy. Somebody you might perceive as wise. Somebody the world perceives as worthy of leadership. Whoever that might be in whatever capacity. You need to know the one who says, I am the truth. I am the way. You need to know the one, the only one, who can enable you to know God. Because Jesus doesn't change. His word gives life rather than takes it. And everything he does is to benefit you. Knowing him makes you a recipient of everything he won at the cross. Knowing him gives you protection over the God of this world. Knowing him gives you an identity that can never be stolen from you again. Your identity as child of God, you can give it away, but the devil no longer has the power to take that from you. Because knowing him gives you authority over him. So I'll leave you with this. Do you know him? Let's pray. Jesus, you have come to us for this very purpose, that we could know you, could know the one true God and Jesus Christ who was sent to us. You came to destroy the work of the devil and you have done so. Even though that, that, the evidence of that remains in the world, we know the war is won. It's all these individual battles going on in the individual lives of people that is ongoing. And God, we ask for victory. We thank you for victory. We ask for an awareness of truth that would allow us to stand. And Lord, as we look into your word next week on what it means to stand, we ask God for hearts and minds to be open and ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to close by singing closing him and let's stand as we sing this I will praise him
bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you, be gracious unto you. And may the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his everlasting peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen, and God bless you all. Have a great week. Thank you.